Hey everybody, we're gonna talk about research philosophy. So I'm gonna share my screen with you here. There we go. And let's, uh, let's talk about you as a researcher and a philosopher. Yes, you. So you as a researcher um, have a belief about research. You have a belief about uh, where knowledge comes from. And that usually resonates somewhere between uh, positivism and constructivism. And because this is a quantitative research class, we're gonna be focusing on more of a, a positivistic framework. Uh, in terms of using empirical data to understand information. So, but let's, let's explore uh, this, this, the, the, these dueling personas of, uh, and, and philosophies uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a researcher. Uh, positivism um, is that um, you understand that knowledge is generated from what can be observed and measured. And this is what we do in quantitative research. We collect information, we, we collect data, we evaluate it, and then, um, and, and, and this data is based on what we, what we observe or what we try to observe. Sometimes we try to observe uh, nuanced information like constructs, things that can't be directly observed. Like I can directly observe your, your height or your weight, but I can't observe um, how, much de how, how depressed you might be. And so, uh, we try to take these constructs of achievement, aptitude, mood, and t mental health, wellness, and turn them into something that can be measured. And, and, and this takes a, a positivistic mindset. We also have constructivism. And constructivism is basically uh, saying that knowledge is generated through how we derive meaning from information that we take in. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can look at the world and we can each see the same thing happening, but derive different information from it. This is why we have different politi political uh, ideologies is because we get, we get similar information sometimes, but how we interpret that information is very different. And so, um, Political science might, might, might sometimes be viewed as more of a constructivist paradigm. So, you know, where you, where you fall into this uh, really determines your identity as a researcher. Uh, but as I said, uh, with the nature of research methods and statistics, we, we usually uh, take a, a positivistic framework. So why do we need to know this philosophy? Well. You know, we need to know this philosophy because you're going to choose a method. And you're going to choose that method based on what is the best way to answer my research question, which ties into how you believe knowledge is generated. So when we're talking about methodology, we're talking about a systematic process that we use to gather information. And ultimately, this is all about producing quality research. This is about you taking information and bringing it out to the public, usually through publications. And publications can be really difficult sometimes because if we're not in tune to our own research identity, you know, what we believe, you know, it's hard to be transparent, rigorous, and defend what we find. So it's important that you understand your, your research identity that you identify with some type of theory, and there you're able to eventually take a conceptual framework, identify what it is that you want to uh, evaluate, measure it, analyze it, and do this in a way that's transparent, rigorous, and defendable. That's how we generate quality research. So, you know, some things to uh, keep in mind. Um, when we do research, research needs to be transparent. Our methods need to be transparent. You should be able to pick up an article and say, I could replicate this study. And you can see the data that uh, were uh, uh, collected. Not necessarily the exact data as it was collected, but you see the demographic information. You see how the data were described. And um, it may not be perfect, 
but you like I, I could collect a similar sample and replicate this process or even improve upon it because no method is perfect. Uh, and keep in mind that it's not just about your sampling, but it's about your entire methodological process. You know, how much error are you allowing into the study? What, uh, what software are you using to analyze your data? What, what um, uh, anal analytical procedure are you using? So being transparent about all of that. Uh, being transparent about your assumptions and how you addressed assumptions, being transparent about your limitations, all right? And making sure that you have a rigorous design, all right? Making sure that you cleaned your data, that your data are accurate, that the way you went about collecting your data and analyzing it was accurate and demonstrates fidelity, all right? There, there, there's, there's honesty in this process. And finally, you can defend what you did. It may not be perfect, but you can explain why you did it. I always have to tell folks, don't fall on your sword, all right? There's limitations in every study. But hopefully, hopefully, you can defend those limitations. Um, and we'll talk more about this, but what I do want you to understand is that when you have limitations, that's not a fatal flaw. It's just the nature of research. Um, when I collect data on adolescents and psychiatric hospitalization, I can't do a random sample. I have to collect data uh, from hospitals that are willing to work with me. And so usually it's just a, a small group of, 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 of programs that I get on board. And so is this a random sample that's perfectly generalizable? No, but I'm collecting data on a doubly protected population. These are minors who need, I need parental consent, I need their assent, and these are, uh, they're in a hospital setting. So it's medical information. So this is a doubly protected population. So when I collect data and people say, oh, I see that your sample isn't a, a random sample, yeah? Show me a study that is with this population because this is pretty difficult data to collect. So anyway, those are some things to think about in terms of you as a researcher and a philosopher.